Good day. I'm Michelle Lavander, Director of the Center for Health Journalism at the University of Southern California. Thanks for joining us today for our Health Matters webinar, Reporting on, reporting on America's Opioid Drug Crisis, offered thanks to a generous grant from the National Institute of Healthcare Management Foundation. Today, we'll be talking about what has often been called the worst drug crisis in America's history, ravaging towns from coast to coast and killing more than 33,000 people in 2015. This webinar will explore the new geography of addiction. The opioid epidemic has proved particularly devastating for white rural communities. Prescription painkillers have long been at the core of the epidemic, but the number of deaths from toxic combinations of drugs and alcohol has risen dramatically every year. We'll be providing an up-to-date overview of the epidemic, how to report on it, and what policymakers can do about it. Here to explain all this and offer their expertise are Dr. Andrew Kolodny, who is the co-director of opioid policy research at the Heller School for Social Policy and Management at Brandeis University. His primary area of focus is the prescription opioid and heroin crisis. He's also the executive director of Physicians for Responsible Opioid Prescribing. He previously served as chief medical officer for Phoenix House, a national nonprofit addiction treatment agency. We'll also hear from Lisa Gearian, a news editor at the Los Angeles Bureau of Reuters. During her 16 years as an investigative reporter at the Los Angeles Times, before that, one story after another, healthcare. Notably, she co-authored two widely hailed series that explored, that explored the role of big pharma and doctors in creating America's addiction to opioids. Kimberly Kindy is a Pulitzer Prize winning investigative reporter at the Washington Post. In 2016, she was part of the reporting team behind the series Unnatural Causes, Sick and Dying in Small Town America, which explored how drugs, alcohol, marketing, and lax federal oversight work to defy modern trends of mortality. Your first from all our speakers, then we'll open it up to your Because we have several hundred people participating in the webinar, we'll ask you to comment in the question field in your control panel, and we'll read out your questions when we get to the Q&A portion of our presentation. If you have any technical challenges, please also text us to the question or comment field in your control panel. We encourage you to tweet about this webinar at the hashtag opioid epidemic. Health journalists and policymakers need to know to tackle this crisis. Uh, uh, thank you, and uh, thanks for this opportunity to, to speak with uh, healthcare reporters and, and with policymakers who are participating on, on the webinar. So I am going to try and uh, uh, focus in on what I think is important uh, for uh, policymakers and journalists to understand about the crisis. Uh, as I think most of us already are well aware, we are in the midst of a severe epidemic of opioid addiction that's fueling record high levels of opioid overdose deaths. The green line on this graph is showing you the total number of, uh, uh, or the rate of opioid overdose deaths in the United States. That includes all of the different uh, types of opioids. Uh, what you can see on this graph with the, the purple line that says commonly prescribed opioids, you could see that from the beginning of the opioid addiction epidemic, and it really begins in the late 90s, up until 2010, the rise in, in total opioid overdoses, that green line at the top, was really fueled by prescription opioids. And then you could see that since uh, 2011, prescription opioid overdose deaths have plateaued. Um, around the same time that we've seen a plateau in prescription opioid deaths, we've seen a very sharp rise in deaths involving heroin. And, and the fact that we've had this plateau at the same uh, of, of prescription opioid deaths at a time when heroin deaths were, have been soaring, I think has led many policymakers and journalists to misinterpret uh, this finding. Um, what you are hearing is that the painkiller problem turned into a heroin problem. Um, and you're, sometimes you're hearing that a, a crackdown on painkillers led to this new heroin problem. And I think that makes for a, a good story. You know, government tries to tackle one problem and 
and inadvertently creates a, a new problem. Um, that really isn't what's going on. Uh, the reason that we've seen a plateau in prescription opioid deaths at the same time that we've seen heroin deaths soar is not because of a sudden switching over from, from painkillers to heroin. Uh, what we actually have are, are two different groups of Americans who are opioid addicted, a younger group and an older group, uh, predominantly using heroin, and the older group has been used prescription opioids. Um, what starts to happen in 2011 is that in the heroin using group, we see deaths soaring, not because of a large sudden shift over to heroin, but because at that time, the starting around 2011, the heroin supply becomes more dangerous. Increasingly, it has fentanyl mixed into it. You see on this uh, slide, fentanyl in orange, um, but these are actually um, not mutually exclusive. It wasn't until pretty recently that we started to pick up on all of the fentanyl that's involved, that's in, in the heroin. So if we go to the next slide, you'll see that the heroin use among young white people in the United States, uh, and the, gra the graph on the right is African Americans, the graph on the left is whites, the red line refers to age groupings. You can see, you know, if you look at the age group 20 to 34, the red line, you'll see that for white people ages 20 to 34, heroin use has been rising rapidly from the beginning of the prescription opioid crisis. That graph begins in 2003, but the red line really starts going up in the late 90s. These are young white people who are switching to heroin after developing addiction through use of prescription opioids, either prescription opioids that they were using recreationally, they did that too much and got addicted, or prescription opioids that were taken medically and they got addicted, or sometimes a combination of both, a brief medical exposure, sports injury, wisdom teeth, the young person is no longer afraid of the drug because they've used it medically. They may have liked the effect they use recreationally for some period after that, and then wind, uh, wind up addicted. Um, and these younger folks who are becoming opioid addicted through use of prescription opioids, once addicted, they have a hard time finding doctors who will maintain them on a large quantity of opioids on a monthly basis. So that younger group has been switching to heroin because heroin is much less expensive. And what we've seen happen over the past 20 years really is we've seen heroin flood into non-urban areas to, to meet the demand for it by these younger people who have developed opioid addiction from prescription opioids. On this graph, uh, for white middle-aged people and older, you don't see a sharp rise in heroin use. Um, unfortunately, that does not mean that older Americans are, have been spared from the opioid addiction epidemic. Um, they haven't been, um, but older people, when they become opioid addicted, they do not have a hard time finding doctors who will maintain them on large quantities of, of opioids. And so, and even when a primary care doc may be concerned that the patient is, could be coming addicted, uh, maybe the patient is coming in early, they don't want to put a label like addiction on the patient. The patient is complaining of pain. So when they get referred anywhere, um, it's to pain specialists. And we're seeing an increasing number of primary care docs now becoming uncomfortable uh, and uh, referring more of their patients to pain specialists, some of whom have no problem continuing the patient on, on very high doses. Um, go to the next graph, you'll see that um, we've actually been seeing more opioid overdose deaths in the older group that gets prescription opioids more easily from doctors than in the younger group that's been using heroin. You see that on this graph, the light blue represents opioid pain reliever deaths, the dark blue represents heroin, and we've seen significantly more overdose deaths in that middle-aged group. I will say in that younger heroin-using group, it's now, they've really, they're starting to catch up. In fact, as of 2015, it's almost equal the number of prescription opioid deaths and heroin deaths. And again, that's because of fentanyl. The opioid crisis is sometimes referred to as a prescription drug abuse problem or a heroin abuse problem. That really is the wrong way to think about it. What we are dealing with is an addiction epidemic. If you think of it as an, as an abuse problem, uh, what 
I believe that suggests in people's minds is that the issue is a lot of people out there behaving badly, taking dangerous drugs because it feels good and they're accidentally killing themselves. That's not it at all. Uh, what we're really dealing with is an epidemic of opioid addiction. The vast majority of deaths occur in people who are addicted. The reason we're experiencing record high numbers of overdose deaths, the reason we're seeing heroin flood into non-urban areas, the reason we're seeing a soaring increase in infants born opioid dependent or children winding up in the foster care system or outbreaks of injection-related infectious diseases. The driver behind all of this is a sharp increase in the prevalence, the number of Americans suffering from opioid addiction. This is a map of the United States three years into the epidemic. Again, I would argue the epidemic begins in 1996. And what you're seeing is states, uh, you're seeing data on people showing up at state licensed drug treatment programs reporting that the drug that they're addicted to is a prescription opioid. The states with the highest rate show up as red or maroon. And I just want you to watch what happens to the color of these maps as we go forward in time by two year increments. So this is 1999, 2001, 2003, 2005, 2007, and 2009. So you can see that by 2009, just about every state in the country had experienced a sharp increase in the prevalence and the number of people suffering from opioid addiction. And when you see a sharp increase in a disease over a short period of time, that is how you would define an epidemic. The reason we've seen this sharp increase in opioid addiction and overdose deaths um, has been because the medical community is overprescribing. And uh, that has been something that the CDC has been trying to communicate for several years now. This graph uh, shows you and with the green line, the sharp increase in prescribing of opioids. Uh, the red line is deaths involving prescription opioids. The blue line is addiction. And again, the CDC has been saying that as the green line has gone up, it's brought up the red line and the blue line along with it. I'm gonna show you a, a quick clip. Uh, if I can, oh, I may not be able to play it. Uh, I was gonna show you a clip uh, indicate uh, with a doctor promoting opioids aggressively. The reason the prescribing took off was because a multifaceted campaign that was funded by opioid manufacturers um, that encouraged the medical community to prescribe opioids aggressively told us that we had been allowing patients to suffer needlessly because of an overblown fear of addiction and that the compassionate way to treat just about any complaint of pain was with an opioid. How do we bring the epidemic to an end? Well, bringing the opioid addiction epidemic to an end is similar to how you might respond to just about any disease epidemic, whether we were talking about Ebola or HIV or, or measles. You, you respond to addiction, you respond to disease epidemics by primarily accomplishing two things. You first have to prevent new people from getting the disease, and, or, or if it's an infectious disease, getting infected. And the other thing you have to do is see that the people who have the disease are receiving effective treatment for that disease so that it doesn't kill them. It's basically the same for the opioid addiction epidemic. We have to prevent more people from becoming addicted. And that really boils down to much more cautious prescribing so that patients don't directly become addicted and so that we don't indirectly cause addiction by stocking everyone's home with we also have to see that people who are addicted are receiving effective treatment for their opioid addiction. And I would lastly say that in the case of a drug epidemic, there is a role for law enforcement. Um, I, I think the war on drugs rightly has a bad reputation because what that meant in many ways was you know, a war on, on drug users and, and mass incarceration. Um, but there is a role for, for law enforcement. If people can easily walk into a pill mill and walk out with 200 tablets of oxycodone, it's gonna be very easy for that person to die of an overdose. And you know, there's also a role for, for making opioids more difficult to access because that makes it much easier to get people engaged in treatment. What you really want is a balance so that effective addiction treatment is easy to access and pills and, and heroin are more difficult to access. So if it's so straightforward, why haven't we brought the opioid addiction epidemic under control? Why is it still getting worse? And again, it's not a new problem. It begins 20 years, 20 years ago and grows worse every year for the past 20 years. I think that the reason that we failed to respond appropriately is because the issue was uh, misframed. 
uh, by, by opioid manufacturers and the, the groups they were funding, I think policymakers and the media to some extent up until recently were really falling for this flawed framework. This is a slide shown at an FDA meeting by uh, someone representing an industry funded organization who was making the case against putting drugs containing hydrocodone into a more restrictive uh, category so that they couldn't be prescribed with lots of refills and easily phoned in. And the point he was making with, the, with this slide was that if we put hydrocodone combination drugs in a more restrictive category, you'd be punishing the pain patient because of the bad behavior of drug abusers and that policymakers should have a balanced approach and, and their effort to stop drug abuse. They, they sh shouldn't do anything that might limit access to opioids for people with pain. Of course, this is a flawed framework. We don't have these two distinct groups, tremendous amount of overlap. Millions of pain patients have become opioid addicted and thousands of, of, of patients with pain have died of overdoses. And a study done in Utah where they looked at everybody who had died of a prescription opioid overdose in the state in, in I think, the 2008-2009 year, they found that 92% of the patients were received a chronic pain diagnosis. It isn't true that the harms of opioids are limited to so-called drug abusers. Op the problem with opioids is, is not abuse. The problem is they're highly addictive and both pain patients and recreational users are becoming addicted. This is a slide showing you deaths from AIDS, and I'm showing this to make a point. You could, the AIDS epidemic began in 1980, and deaths from AIDS peaked at around 1995, and then we saw this drop in deaths. What we were doing was turning HIV infection from a terminal disease into a, a chronic disease with the introduction of effective treatments. I believe we have a medication available to us now that would allow us to do, do that for opioid overdose deaths if there was better access to it. The medication I'm referring to is buprenorphine, also called Suboxone, and I'm not just speculating. We did see with, when uh, in France with the release of buprenorphine, we saw a 79% decline in opioid overdose deaths in six years. I will uh, finish up here. Uh, in summary, the United States is in the midst of a severe epidemic of opioid addiction. This is the worst drug addiction epidemic in United States history. To bring the epidemic to an end, we have to prevent new cases of opioid addiction, and we have to make sure that people who are addicted can access effective treatment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kolodny. Lisa, what did your investigative reporting uncover about the role of big pharma and doctors? So um, that's a great question. And um, um, Dr. Kolodny's um, presentation was a perfect setup um, for, for uh, what we did. Um, and I'm really happy to see the picture that Lynn Webster showed to the FDA of the um, grandmother who looks like she's in pain versus the um, kids at a pill popping party. Um, because when we started our investigation and um, I sort of traced the beginning to the September 2011 article. Um, when we started, the conventional wisdom was that um, doctors and um, drug makers um, didn't play a big role. The big problem was um, bad people, mostly teenagers, um, abusing um, pills for fun and recreation. So um, the very first story we did, we actually, um, got CDC statistics to see really what we're talking about with the um, opioid epidemic. And um, we were able to show for the first time that um, drug deaths were outnumbering traffic fatalities in the United States, um, killing almost 40,000 people in 2009. Um, and it was, uh, that was the first year that those two trend lines crossed. Um, what I wanted to show you in this article is um, something that kind of struck us as odd, if the problem was teenage pill poppers, um, it's true, oh, drug fatalities among teenagers um, did increase. They more than doubled um, uh, during an eight year period that we looked at the statistics. But among people aged 50 to 69, um, those deaths tripled and the death toll was highest among people um, in their 40s. So, um, 
that uh, that got us um, kind of wondering about the conventional wisdom, and that sort of set us on our track for investigating what was really going on. So again, um, we have this problem of prescription overdoses, you know, killing um, a lot of people. Um, it, it, drug overdoses had become one of the few types of preventable deaths in the United States that um, that are were and still are on the rise, and it's the opioids, the painkillers that um, are the problem. The conventional wisdom that we were presented with from all the experts and the doctors groups and the pharma groups was that um, diversion was the problem, pharmacy robberies, bad people, the internet, teenagers stealing from grandma's medicine cabinet, teenagers stealing from medicine cabinets at open houses, and teenagers stealing, following old people home from the pharmacy and stealing medicine from their medicine cabinets. Um, so we dug in to see, well, okay, what's the disconnect between who's dying and, um, and you know, who's supposedly the problem? And um, these were our sources. We, we dug into the, um, what had been reported already. We looked at the medical literature. Um, there's an important government drug abuse survey that gave some credence to this teenage idea. Um, and uh, then we looked at mortality studies. And um, so the government survey that I'm talking about, I'm sure many people on this call are familiar with. It's the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. Um, it uh, surveys 70,000 people nationwide every year. It's um, the information we get from it is more timely and more granular than um, CDC mortality data, which takes a while to come together. Um, it focuses on min, mi, misuse of drugs and non-medical use, um, but it has some um, drawbacks. It misses some users. Um, importantly, dead people don't answer surveys. So the actual people who were overdosing um, were perhaps not captured. Um, but what it had been showing was that, um, you know, it supports this idea of the teenage pill poppers that 64% or 66% of um, people who were uh, misusing painkillers were uh, getting them or buying them from a friend or relative um, or taken without asking. Um, now, there, there, uh, there's also the internet and then drug dealers are strangers. But within that, you can see this uh, prescriptions from a doctor or more than one doctor in the survey is comprising about 20%, about you know one in five people who misuse these drugs were actually you know, um, acknowledging that they were getting them from a doctor. Um, then we looked at the medical literature and mortality studies that had um, gone before. Um, so those were live people answering surveys about misuse. Now we're asking the question, who's dying? And so um, one of the only mortality studies that we could find at the time was a 2008 study that was published in um, the Journal of the American Medical Association, and it looked at 300 overdose deaths in West Virginia. And their finding was that 63% um, involved a diverted drug. So supporting this, this thesis that diversion, you know, bad people, bad activity, you know, um, is, is, the pro is the root of the problem. That study, um, and it was the only one that we could find that actually looked at where the drugs were coming from um, that were killing people, they did not report percentage um, drugs prescribed to the decedent by a doctor. So that's what we did. Um, we, uh, some colleagues um, of mine at the LA Times and I um, gathered, um, when we started, we actually gathered more than 10,000 um, data um, on more than 10,000 overdose deaths in Southern California from um, several Southern California counties over a six year period. Um, we ended up with um, about 4,000 um, deaths that fit our criteria. They were accidental, not suicide. They involved opioids um, and, um, uh, and, and in uh, some cases, they involved uh, doctor's prescriptions. So what we found was that in um, nearly half of the cases, we were able, and this is a very conservative estimate because we had to, uh, it was impossible to pin every uh, death on a prescriber um, and to trace because, as you can imagine, um, um, 
there's a lot of doctors with the same last names and oftentimes that's all we had because that information was taken from pill bottles collected by coroner's investigators at death scenes. So um, uh, using um, an incredibly conservative approach, we found that near, in nearly half of the cases, we were able to overdose death with the cause of death, the actual type of drug, to an actual prescription, oftentimes written you know, within the past 30 days um, by a doctor to the decedent. Um, and so that was, um, at the time, something that uh, really kind of, as the um, then drug, drug czar said, was a, a game changer in terms of the uh, conversation about what was really fueling um, this epidemic. What we also learned was, we learned a lot about the prescribers and we learned a lot about the decedents. Um, the prescribers, we, we actually found um, 71 doctors in Southern California who had three or more patients die of prescription overdose deaths on prescriptions that they wrote during our time period. Um, the guy at the top of the list, um, uh, pictured on the right here, had uh, at the time 16 overdoses, and I think he's had at least one since we published. Um, and most of them had clean records. Many of them were so-called um, pain specialists. Um, and, uh, and by clean records, I mean nothing with the uh, California um, Medical Board. Um, and in fact, as it turned out, the California Medical Board had no idea that, um, you know, doctors that, whose um, practices they were supposed to be supervising um, had had, you know, multiple patients die of overdoses in a, in a fairly short window. And when they read our story, they were extremely interested in um, being able to get that kind of information on a regular basis from um, coroners in the state of California. So they could look and try and, um, you know, intercede and, you know, remediate or correct problem prescribing uh, or worse, uh, criminal behavior, um, and there's a range. Um, so what we learned about the decedents was um, we, we dug in, obviously we had a lot of deaths, we had nearly 4,000 deaths, but we took particular um, interest in a close look at um, 298 patients. Um, these are the patients of the 71 doctors who had three or more deaths in their practices in the six year period. And we actually, in addition to um, data, we, got, we actually got the full autopsy reports on um, each of these patients. Um, and um, you see the age range was 21 to 70, but the average age was 48. So that um, reinforces the CDC, what the CDC was saying. They were all kinds of people. These were not your, none of, they're not, obviously there were no teenagers and um, uh, they weren't people who um, were, you know, stealing from grandma's medicine. to be people who accidents, things like that, and got involved with opioids um, through a doctor for um, real pain and in search of relief. Um, sometimes they took extra doses, it was clear in the autopsy reports, because they were in pain and it wasn't relieved by, the, by their regular dose. Um, and again, they became addicted for real injuries. The drugs that were involved, um, these are... Um, not mutually exclusive. So, you know, one death could have hydrocodone and oxycodone involved, but the number of deaths in which um, uh, hydrocodone products such as Vicodin and Norco um, were involved was 362. That was the greatest one. That shouldn't be a surprise. That's the number one um, most widely prescribed um, type of opioid in the United States. The next was oxycodone, which is sold as Oxycontin and Percocet, Oxycontin being the number one um, most of, uh, prescribed brand drug um, in the United States. And uh, on down, um, uh, alprazolam is not an opioid. Um, it's a, uh, a muscle, uh, an anti-anxiety drug. It's in a different category, but it also is a, a you know, respiratory depressant and <clears throat> compounds the effect and on down. Um, so our sources were coroner's reports, um, the real linchpin of this series and being able to get at the doctors was we discovered that um, when coroners investigate a uh, suspected overdose, they um, first they collect pill bottles at the scene for a number of reasons. One is they want to try and figure out what, you know, what kind of tox tests to run, um, what killed this person. 
number two, to safeguard the scene because you don't want somebody coming in behind and um, accidentally um, getting their hands on any of their drugs. And so they um, put that together in something called a various names, but commonly a medication inventory log. It's like an evidence log. And it will include the date of everything that's on the label, the date of the prescription, the number of pills, the dosage, the name of the drug, um, how many pills are left in the bottle. That they were prescribed. Anyway, uh, we also we we you know vetted the doctors and figured out who they were with licensing board records, um, and we um, very tedious process, but we had to translate a lot of misspellings and um, various names for oxycodone, for example, Percocet, you know, um, oxycontin, et cetera, into one sort of common language of um, of the sort of basic drug. Um, I don't think you guys need to know all of this. Um, Anyway, so um, uh, that's what we did. And um, one of the really interesting things that we were able to do with all of this, with the, with the subset of the 298 people who got their drugs from one of the doctors who had three or more patients die, was we were able to really dig in and go, okay, these people got um, opioids prescribed by a doctor. Should the doctor have prescribed to this person and what kind of care should they have taken um, when they were prescribing to them? So at the time, we knew that um, a real red flag for prescribing an opioid is um, a history of an overdose, a history of rehab, a history of substance abuse, anxiety, depression, and mental illness, and suicide attempts. And so um, we have an interactive graphic that you can basically look and see, you know, put input any of these um, red flags and see how many of the patients and or the decedents, you know, had these warning signs that um, the doctors, um, if they're doing their jobs properly, should have taken a history and known about, and if they had um, been very thoughtful about um, how they prescribed. So um, all of them had, almost all of them, all but five, had at least one red flag. Um, so uh, we thought that was a very um, important finding. Um, after that, we decided to, um, we sort of stumbled into a role um, in the whole um, epidemic, the role of one of the drug makers, um, one of the biggest ones, Purdue Pharma. And we kind of stumbled into it because he was well known, the biggest promoters of opioids for all kinds of pain and for chronic pain. Um, that had been well established. Um, but what we were able to find was that the company was actually keeping very, very close track of prescribers. Um, um, we ended up finding that they kept very close track of prescribers. They had a list of 1,800 doctors who they knew were um, high prescribers and potentially suspicious uh, prescribers. And that was not information that they were sharing with um, the DEA and medical boards and things like that. Um, later, we, we were able to find that they also um, had a, a very clear picture of what was happening inside pharmacies. And so they could see pharmacies that had suspicious Oxycontin ordering. You know, they'd order two bottles a month, they'd order 600 bottles. Um, and again, that information was not um, shared. And I think my time's out, and that, um, so I'll, I'll talk more if there's any questions later and um, leave it at that. Great. Thank you so much, Lisa. We're going to turn now to Kimberly. Can you share your strategies for reporting and storytelling on the complex interplay of prescription, prescription drugs and alcohol and their devastating effect on rural white women in particular? Sure. Um, uh, thanks so much for having me. Uh, I, I, the, I was part of a team um, last year that looked at um, why middle-aged white women were dying at an accelerated pace, unlike any other developed country. And we knew that opioids was uh, played a, an outsized role in this, but there were also these so-called diseases of despair. There were a lot of suicides. There were other things. Um, a lot of 
binge drinking um, that has become very common, with, particularly with uh, middle-aged women. Um, and I, so we were trying to answer this this broader question. Um, so this this was our overriding question: Were you know why are middle-aged white women's death rates rising? And we we found just doing the initial data analysis that from 1990 through 2014, the mortality rate for white women rose in most parts of the country, particularly around small cities and in rural areas, and that rates often went up by as much as 40 percent and in some places doubled and this was particularly in the rural areas and so i was looking for a way to um combine data as well as the you know uh stories of of women and their families uh at the ground level and so the first thing i i started you know looking around for was, was a county i go to and I went, ended up going to Kern County, uh, California. I don't know if you can kind of, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but you know, it's around in, in here. And since you, since a lot of people there are probably from California, you can probably have an idea of where that's at um, in central California. And as you can see from this chart. Kimberly, if you, it, if you minimize your um, control panel, then people can see your cursor better. Sorry, right. Michelle here. Uh, minimize my control panel. Um, okay. Uh, You know where the current and I was trying to find a place to embed to be able to network and and sort of tell the story uh, um, from the ground level. But I also wanted to go to a place that that readers and others wouldn't dismiss um, uh, as a place where white people have been dying forever, um, because this is truly, as um, Lisa and Dr. Clontney pointed out, you know, obviously a national crisis, a national epidemic. And so the first thing I did, though, I I should say that I, in part, why I picked Kern County was that um, I also understand and know Kern County. The one county over is Tulare County, where my mom and dad met one another, where my grandma um, lived, where my aunts and my cousins. I would stay. So I had a sense of the culture of that community, and I thought that it would um, not only help me tell the story, but also help me relate to the people once I got there, um, since I'd be trying to win over their trust. But the first thing I did, which I always do before I try to parachute into a place, is um, kind of, this is an old-fashioned term, but burn the phone lines. And so I did that, and this is how I found the woman who has her finger to her lips, uh, Ellen Eggert. Um, I just started reaching out to every single person who might have contact with either a woman who fit this description, white woman between the ages of 35 and 60, who either died of suicide or had developed a, a, a problem with pain medication, um, and uh, and either had had died or maybe was even struggling with um, e either in recovery or was struggling to try to keep uh, from going over the the, the cliff. And um, so I, I called uh, church leaders who at mega churches where they have big recovery programs and county mental health and um, county public health and psychologists and. Uh, all kinds of people who might be coming in contact with the women. And I ended up talking to a lot of people, but Ellen ended up being my door opener. Um, she put me in contact with a number of people that once I got on the ground, I could immediately start talking to um, people who had lost sisters and, and aunts to painkiller overdoses or to suicide and um, as well as people in recovery. Um, the reason why she was so incredibly well networked with everyone is because she has run an unprecedented amount of programs in my mind. I don't know when she sleeps. Uh, she um, ran the drug and alcohol rehab programs for the county for a really long time. She now manages the suicide hotline. She has a nonprofit uh, suicide prevention organization that's based in Kern County. She also um, has created a program 
that trains surviving family members to on how to provide counseling to people who've just lost a loved one to suicide. And really the list goes on. So every time I would go and meet with somebody, whether it's whether I met her that person through Ellen or whether I found them on my own, they always seemed to know her. And it really helped a lot uh, because sometimes people didn't want to talk to me, particularly the coroner, which proved to be invaluable until they knew that Ellen was working uh, to help me. Um, and but it's, it was interesting because as I I kept talking to Ellen over a period of time, a couple of weeks before I landed on the ground there, she didn't bring up until the third or fourth conversation that precisely what I was describing fit the description of one of her friends of like more than 20 years, Karen Franklin. So she had a personal friend who she had uh, was trying to help and had been trying to help for uh, decades. Um, who, as you can see by her hand and how many pills are filled in it, that she, um, when I met her, she was on 13 different prescription medications. And so when I landed on the ground, I immediately started spending some time with Karen. It, it all started with a back injury. It all started with, um, with painkillers, but it, it had exploded because one thing seemed to lead to another. And I became very interested in this trend that it was not just opioids, but rather um, other drugs that um, opioids can sometimes lead people to end up um, being on. Uh, so I started um, talking to experts about this and somebody who's like really phenomenal um, and really understands this is a Harvard pain psychologist named Beth Darnell. Um, and this is from her book, Less Pain, Fewer Pills. And it gives you some insight as to why um, opioids may lead to other drugs. Uh, they, over time, uh, people start taking more opioids because they aren't as effective. Um, they can lead to sleep problems. And so people go to their doctors and they say, hey, I'm not sleeping. And then they get sleep medications for their insomnia. Um, it often leads to other problems that cause um, depression or depression to worsen and they end up on antidepressants. There's also, she also said that um, that anxiety levels often increase with people who are abusing opioids, which leads them to get on anti-anxiety medications. So you can just see how, uh, I, I started to see how you, people like Karen end up, you know, with one or two pills in their hand, but years later, they end up with a handful of them. And I was very interested in whether or not there was a drug combination that was also a huge driver in, in the epidemic that people were, were looking at. Um, so we have this, we, we did a little bit of data crunching, and I should say that um, I could talk about all the different data sets that we used, but uh, when I was talking to our data person who worked with me on this story, he said that one of the most valuable things was something that m me, who, who I'm obsessed with data, but I don't do data crunching, um, that I went out and I gathered like every academic paper that I could find that analyzed this and I would bring it to him. And the great thing about reading scientific research is that the researchers always list the data sets that they used and they always list the formulas that they use so you know precisely how they arrived at their data and, and why they arrived at their conclusions. And that really sort of provided a bit of a path for us in terms of trying to look at how these drug combinations might be fueling the, uh, the death rates. So what we found was between 1999 and 2014, the number of middle-aged white women dying annually from opioid overdoses shot up 400%, and that anti-anxiety drugs um, known as benzodiazepines, often referred to as benzos, um, were contributing to a gro growing share. It was about a third um, over the past several years. And the thing that Lisa would definitely would know um, better than I is that when uh, coroner reports or, or death records, they're, um, they're very spotty. There's no consistent way in which cause of death is listed. So we know this is an, uh, a, you know, a, an under-reported uh, number because often um, 
if it's just a doctor, if somebody's been sick for a really long time and the doctor signs a death certificate, there sometimes can be pressure uh, to just list natural causes. Um, if a coroner comes in and analyzes it, if the um, some coroners would just list the painkiller because maybe that was what they considered to be the biggest factor, they don't necessarily always also list benzos. So uh, with this number being small yet still incredibly significant, it it, it continued to make me ask every woman I met, uh, you know, on what other you're taking before you stop taking pills. Um, and this is a graphic that ran with my story that sort of shows you how these pills in combination can act on the brain. As Lisa mentioned, they, um, they slow down your uh, respiratory system. It's part of why they have a calming effect on people. But when you take them in combination, they actually can cause people to stop breathing. So this is part of why the combinations are particularly, this combination is particularly deadly. Um, just one second. I want to make sure that I'm not missing something. Oh, so so I'm, I'm starting to talk to all these women and I'm getting their stories and I'm starting to see this, you know, combination of things, but I was really, really struggling with getting sort of ground level data. Um, because of HIPAA laws, I couldn't get the granular data that I wanted um, on the deaths uh, of women between the ages of 35 and 60 that I was looking at. And so I was, I, I kept trying to negotiate different ways to get these data sets, but I just kept hitting a wall because there were there were just too many things that made it impossible. And so I went to the coroner's office and I kept calling and I kept not getting return phone calls. And I asked, finally was able to get her to meet with me when I was on my second trip to Bakersfield, um, which is the biggest city in Kern County. And I asked her how, if I could get all of the coroner reports, which were which are a public record in California. Another reason why I chose to go to California, um, and I was wanted all of the accidental overdoses and I wanted all of the suicides. And um, she said that's just impossible. We don't have the manpower to pull all of those. None of them had been digitized, and. Um, it really meant somebody going to a storage shed and pulling out boxes. And so I was like, well, what if I ratchet it back to the coroner reports? And okay, that's about 80. I don't know, I'm gonna have to check and see. And so I, I left and then the next day I called her and I, that team um, that have just lost someone to suicide and the person who introduces Ellen and her team to Ellen and her team is the was the coroner so they had a, a really strong relationship by the next day all of those reports were being pulled for me and so once I got those reports I did what I really always do now when I get documents before I even read my very first report or document I open a spreadsheet and I just started listing everything that I was reading, the name of the person, their age, marital status, year, cause of death, um, other significant things, where they lived, um, did they leave a suicide note? And then I started listing all the drugs. And then I started creating a category for each of the drugs so that I could count it at the end. And so by the, in, by the time I read the last corn report, I had a mini database and it allowed me to write this uh, and provide some insight as to what was happening with the suicides. It wasn't just the opioid um, overdoses or the combination of opioids and benzos that were um, causing these accidental overdoses. Um, often um, suicide was listed and the underlying cause or what drugs were in their system was really nowhere to be found unless you looked at each of those reports, which is what I did. So I was able to tabulate and show that with the women who had died um, of suicide, that half of the overdoses um, that 
opioids, benzos, and alcohol were all in their bloodstreams. And that even with the people who had um, died by suicide, that was not a drug overdose, that these drugs were in their system and played an outsized role in their lives leading up to the moment when they decided to um, take their life. Um, one other thing that I should point out is that I, um, you know, back to back to Ellen, I one of the things that was really, really helpful was that when I met with people, um, I, the, one of the one of the families that I met with had lost a, um, a sister to, to, to suicide. And when I when I was talking to the surviving sister, she said the day that she died by suicide, that that was the day that she was supposed to meet with her therapist, the sister's therapist. And the more we talked, the more I was like, you know, I'd like to talk to your therapist. Is that okay? Because she she may have some insight as to what's going on there in, in Kern County. So I met with this woman, Joan, and these are two graphs that I pulled from the story. And I, I asked her, what does your practice look like? And she said, well, 20 years ago, I, I had, you know, I was dealing mostly with teenagers. And now half my practice are middle-aged white women who are abusing anti-anxiety drugs, painkillers, and alcohol. And I was like, whoa, um, what do you think's going on there? And her insight was that there was something that was happening all at the same time, which I thought was interesting. In 2001, um, the federal government changed its guidelines and recommended against hormone replacement therapy for women who were entering into menopause or going through menopause. And this is the same exact time where the um, opioids and anti-anxiety medications became, um, in her mind, sort of replacement drugs and created a problem. And so part of her practice is actually referring people to this woman call, who they call the hormone queen of Bakersfield, um, who uh, works with people to get them off their painkillers and to, um, to try horm some hormone replacement therapies that are different from the old uh, ones that can, um, that can, that can help. Uh, this is, you know, some people argue against this being part of it, but it was really interesting that all of these things kind of coincided with uh, the removal of hormone replacement therapy being available to women and this particular age group that was, um, you know, turning more and more to these drugs. So I thought it was in interesting and something worth noting. The one last thing that I wanted to mention was that uh, this was sort of all in plain sight. Um, I, although I started working on the story about the polydrug use, that it wasn't just opioids, uh, there in, you know, like February or March, my story didn't publish until I think it was May and the CDC guideline for prescribing opioids was released and widely, widely covered by the media and almost all the news stories were focused on the guideline for prescribing opioids. And yet in this guideline, benzodiazepines were mentioned 41 times as being a, 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 a dangerous combination. And the guideline also went into some detail about how doctors needed to avoid that too. It mentioned alcohol 22 times. And yet, you know, we continue to really not see is, you know, very much press coverage or very much conversation more broadly in the policy arena about what to do about this combination that can be so deadly. Um, you know, and, and I think that there's way more reporting and way more work that can be done in this area because, because this one drug leads to other things. Uh, one of the stories that was in our package that I did not do, but was a fantastic piece, looked at how drug companies are now capitalizing on um, uh, medications that help with opioid related constipation. There's a whole huge industry now uh, where people are taking medications to help them with their constipation because they've been on opioids for so long and they have that problem. And so um, and I think it's a whole huge area of coverage and, and, and policy questions that could receive more attention.
And thank that's you it. so much, Kimberly. Oh, perfect timing. Um, I think we're going to turn to some of our questioners, um, folks. If you, um, this is fabulous three presentations. I'm hoping you guys can maybe stay a little longer because uh, I, I see a lot of questions here. If you have a question, you can type it into the question field. And uh, by uh, a woman named Andrea Whitestone, it's kind of a, a mix, of, it's more of a statement, I suppose, but she's in risk management for a large multi-specialty pain management practice. And um, this is directed to Dr. Kolodny. She says, the suggestion that anyone walks out of a medical practice with 200 tablets of oxycodone seems very inflammatory. Pain management patients go through many steps in our practice, including random urine screens, random pill counts, no more than one month supply at a time. Uh, and she details a host of other procedures. Where are these practices you're referencing? Most of these issues are not coming from legitimate prescribers. So how is more regulation on doctors going to affect affect this? She goes on to call some of these comments inflammatory and out of context and raise questions about using percentages rather than raw numbers and, and how many people are really being discussed in her final remark. The rhetoric needs to be turned way down. So. Um, she represents one strand of the kind of comments and questions we're getting, and so, Dr. Kolodny, I'm hoping that that you can you can uh, reply. Sure. Well, my comment about a patient walking out of an office with 200 pills was in the context of the need to crack down on pill mills. So I wasn't speaking about legitimate medical practices where, when I said that you know patients walking out with 200 pills could easily die of an overdose on those pills. I was referring to pill mills. But I will say that um, there is a notion that, uh, and it's been argued for a while, and it contributed to our, our failed response to the crisis, the notion that the opioid crisis is all about bad apples. And we talked a little bit about the, the, the bad apples. I really just want to get high. It's really come from medical societies that have said, you know, this whole issue is that there are some bad patients out there and there are some bad doctors running pill mills. But, you know, the opioid crisis has nothing to do with legitimate doctors taking care of legitimate patients. And that's totally not true. In fact, I would argue that the opioid crisis has really been fueled by well-meaning doctors and dentists and nurse practitioners who are inadvertently getting their patients addicted. I think that the pill mill doctors are doctors who, like other, like any drug dealer uh, selling opioids, most of the customers are people who are already addicted. And the patients seeking out the doctor feel goods are usually already addicted. And so the pill mill doctors are profiteering off of the addiction epidemic, but it really is well-meaning medical professionals who have been underestimating how highly addictive these drugs are and overestimating how helpful they can be when prescribed long term. I'd like, I'd, li I'd like to respond to that as well, Michelle, if I could. Absolutely, yeah. So just in terms of um, also these mechanisms um, that your questioner referred to in terms of managing risk <clears throat> among chronic pain patients, we, of the 71 doctors we identified who had three or more patients die, um, we interviewed, I believe, five of them um, at length on videotape, and some of those videotapes are on our website, on the LA Times website, with our story. Um, and um, what we learned was that um, 201, they practice most of these um, commonly used strategies, urine tests, paying uh, contracts, pill counting, that kind of thing. 201, they had good records. Um, most of them were boarded. They had gone to good medical schools. Um, they were held in high regard. Um, and yet, this happened to them. And there is some scholarship around the idea that these mechanisms just don't work, um, that they are not protective against overdoses and overdose deaths. Um, and then um, and the only other thing I would say is, um, I'm just, you know, one, you know, wondering if, if the, the risk manager keeps track of overdoses, uh, fatal and non-fatal, among the um, pain patients that um, are, are in their cohort there. Thank you. Um, there's a question from Nassim Miller, who says, there's a proposed bill in Florida right now 
that's limiting first opioid prescriptions to five days. Some doctors say this will negatively affect those who have chronic pain or others like uh, patients with cancer. Is there a right or wrong side here? What's the best way to report this in a balanced way? And what does the evidence show when it comes to this particular argument? Uh, should I take that? Any of you can reply. It wasn't meant for any one so, person. So, so uh, there are uh, several states now that have introduced laws to limit the duration of a first-time prescription. And some states have gone with seven days. Some have gone with five days. Uh, these are focused on acute pain prescriptions. I don't know that they would have any impact on patients with chronic pain. And the legislation is uh, where the, you're seeing these bills. Um, there are also exclusions for people with cancer. So again, I don't think it would impact somebody who might need opioids for, for uh, cancer pain treatment. What I do like about these bills is that they show that policymakers are beginning to recognize that overprescribing of opioids is fueling the, the crisis. Up until very recently, the focus was almost entirely on stopping kids from getting into grandma's medicine chest. NIDA, SAMHSA, FDA were focused on reducing so-called non-medical use. And you know, you're finally seeing a recognition that, that it's overprescribing that's fueling the problem. And so you're seeing an attempt by policymakers to get at that problem. And to look at acute pain prescriptions is important because we, we know that far more opioids are being prescribed than, than necessary for acute pain. And that is a way people are getting addicted, addicted in a way that we're stocking homes with a highly addictive drug. Every four hours, there are more than 80 pills in that prescription. So, you know, the, I don't know that if you analyze uh, prescribing patterns or the quantities prescribed in states where these laws are passed, whether you'll see any real impact. But I, I do at least like that policymakers are finally recognizing that the way doctors are prescribing opioids is fueling the epidemic. Lisa or Kimberly, did you want to weigh in on this? No, uh, not, not me. Think, yeah, I think you covered it. So we have a question from Ed Williams, who's written on these topics for a public radio station in New Mexico. He writes, the drug enforcement agencies reducing manufacture of prescription opioids in 2017. What impact do you expect this to have and what unintended consequences? I'm sorry, can you repeat that question? Sure. Um, he says that the drug enforcement agency is reducing the manufacture of prescription opioids in 2017. Yeah. Um, so uh, that uh, move by the DEA will probably have absolutely no impact at all. Um, the DEA for the past 20 years, up until recently, was increasing the quota, allowing more opioids to be manufactured each year. And I believe the reason they were doing that is that the quota system was linked to medical prescribing so that as the prescribing was going up, uh, the DEA would lift the quota to go up with the increase in, in prescribing. What DEA did by finally reducing the quota was really pull in some of the slack now that we've seen a plateau and a slight decline in, in opioid prescribing. So I don't think this is going to have any impact at all. They're just really pulling in some of the extra slack now that opioid prescribing has stopped going up. We have a question from John Bunton who asks if you could share uh, that the stories you shared about experiences with coroner's offices are very helpful, but could the panelists talk more about experiences with state licensing boards? What could they provide? How hard was that to access? And any access to EDER data for public or state-owned hospitals? Well, I think, um, that... I think Lisa uh, would be great for that question. Yeah, I think that's yeah, so, a Lisa question. At, at least in the state of California, um, and I think in a lot of states as well, um, licensing boards are where you can find um, all the license information about a doctor, um, typically, uh, sometimes where they were trained, how long they've been licensed, um, what the address of their practice is, what their name is. Um, and you can also see if they're, if 
there's any record of um, sanction or investigation um, or anything like that. So you can see if they've had a problem with prescribing in the past. Um, and um, that's pretty much what they're good for. What, what was interesting, though, in our case was that, you know, where the, where the coroner was getting the deaths piling up over here, um, and the medical board um, was absolutely in the dark about that. I mean, they just, you know, there were doctors with lots and lots of patients dying, and, um, you know, if, um, it, it's probably likely that the medical board would have learned that if um, a surgeon, say, was losing people on an operating table at that rate or, you know, um, but this was just something that was really opaque. The coroners were not reporting these stuff to the medical board. Um, and it was something the medical board thought would be a really good way to surveil, to do surveillance on this um, growing problem um, and to see where the clusters of deaths were. And, you know, what kind of, you know, did that mean that, you know, could mean that that particular doctor is dealing with the highest risk pain patients, you know, and it's absolutely unavoidable. They did everything right, you know, or it could mean that there's some kind of remedi remediation that's necessary um, with the practice. And so that's, they're really interested in that. Um, I have a question. If I could just, from, if I could just oh, add a little, a little bit to, you know, I, I think that the one way of understanding our opioid addiction epidemic would be through a regulatory failure lens. A regulatory failure on the part of the Food and Drug Administration, which should have been regulating opioid manufacturers, and regulatory failure on the part of state medical boards that should have been regulating the medical community. And in fact, during the era to promote aggressive prescribing, state medical boards even encouraged doctors in their states to prescribe opioids more aggressively, uh, believing that we there had, had been a chilling effect and that doctors were too fearful of prescribing. State medical boards across the board are complaint-driven. Um, and even though they uh, do have, and, and if in states where they, they don't, they should have access to state prescribing data that could be used to monitor prescribers, they don't do that. Instead, it's, it's complaint driven. And when a complaint is registered, typically they request the, the chart or the charts of a doctor. And if the charts look good, uh, nothing will happen to that uh, prescriber. So, uh, you know, I think state medical boards in, in many states have really failed to play their role. We have a question from Suzanne Bohan who asks, if a panelist can elaborate on these deaths as deaths of despair, is a significant part of the solution examining the role of stress from financial hardships, loss of hope, and so on, and how that can increase susceptibility. The focus on overprescribing seems to give insufficient attention to the social milieu behind this epidemic. Um, I'll go ahead and address that since that was sort of our whole series. Uh, you know, we were completely agree. It's it's a really complicated um, thing. How do you how to how do you address why people are so filled with despair and sadness that they um, maybe turn to these things? I mean, a number of women that I talked to, they didn't they. Uh, you know, they did have like, uh, they broke their wrist or something like that, and they legitimately got painkillers, but they had a lot of other things going on in their life too. And when they realized that this also could sort of, sort of help numb the pain of their life, they stayed on them. And so um, it may not be exactly how it started, but it can be part of why people stay on them. And then as they stay on them, become addicted. Um, but you know, there are a, a number of groups that are, it's like a, it's a community-based thing. There needs to be greater awareness at the community level where um, people will come together and try to um, provide support systems for people. It, you know, this is, we saw this in the election and, uh, you know, so, so much of the, um, the votes for Trump had to do with people feeling a loss of hope and feeling like they there was no way out of um, their situation. And so if the country doesn't come to um, uh, terms with that and at the community level, people don't start to get the kind of support that they need, um, you're right, this 
you know, it's, it's part of the equation. It's part of the crisis and it's part of what needs to be addressed for sure. But it is sort of, it does need to be sort of, sort of grassroots. You can't have the federal government prescribe what's going to be effective in Kern County uh, and have it be perfect in, uh, in something that could be replicated somewhere else. Um, it's a, it's a local issue. And that means that communities need to mobilize and find ways to um, address these problems. And it's, it's not, it's not easy. And, you know, like in Kern County, one of the big problems uh, with, with um, their economy is uh, the, the boom and bust cycle with oil and gas, which is like what they really, really depend on and problems with agriculture that were created by the drought. And so how do you fix drought and how do you fix the oil and, and gas boom and bust um, that so affects your economy and causes people to lose their jobs? And uh, it's, 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 the, it's one of the most important things that needs to be addressed, but it's not simple. Yeah. Um, if I could just add uh, to that, uh, you know, I, I think when it comes to addiction to highly addictive drugs like heroin, like prescription opioids, like nicotine, the common pathway toward becoming addicted is repeated use of that drug. Mm-hmm. And if you're repeating use of the drug because of despair, because of a lack of economic opportunity, because you're depressed and you're medicating your depression, or if you're repeating use because you find it fun, or if you're repeating use because a doctor's prescribing it to you, it's the repeated use of the drug that will ultimately lead to addiction in, in many patients or many people. And you know, I think that if you look at the geographic differences, if you look at uh, counties uh, across the country that have been hit hardest, the most consistent finding is not, it's not economic. It's the counties and states where opioids are prescribed more aggressively that we tend to see higher rates of addiction and overdose deaths. There are many um, well-to-do communities that have, are being hit by the opioid addiction epidemic and some of America's poorest communities with the least economic opportunities, low income minority communities have been spared the opioid uh, crisis. So I really do, again, think that the common pathway is repeated use of a highly addictive drug that's being prescribed, overprescribed by the medical community. Hi there. Um, we have a question from Ivan Becerra. He has two questions. One. Have professional medical associations such as the AMA or pharmaceutical trade organizations taken public responsibility for opioid pain relief management? And his second question is, we hear so much about the opioid epidemic that he sees coverage fatigue or exhaustion. How can organizations working in the trenches better collaborate with journalists to keep telling this important story? Uh, so, well, I, I can say that, you know, up until the AMA has been a little bit better in the past year or so, I can't say that they've really acknowledged that much responsibility, but up until recently, the AMA was actively siding with the opioid lobby against efforts to rein in over prescribing. Um, the AMA weighed in against putting hydrocodone in, the, in a more restrictive category, the AMA weighed in against label changes on opioid analgesics that would have prohibited the drug makers from promoting opioids for conditions where they're not safe or effective. The past year, we've seen a change, um, and I I think a move in the direction of of acknowledging its role. Um, But I think many different organizations participated and many individuals participated in the movement to increase prescribing of opioids in the United States. Um, I, I think many of the the players involved in this, they weren't just doing it because drug companies were stuffing money in their pockets and saying these are the lies we want you to tell. I think there many of the many of the people involved in this were truly duped. I think they really had fallen for the notion that opioids are a gift from Mother Nature and were allowing people to suffer needlessly and by by under prescribing. Um, so uh, a lot of accountability to to go around, and and I think not enough accepting of of, of the blame yet. I've also seen, um, if not medical societies, um, uh, pro- provider organizations, and um, the insurance community, um, you know, taking steps to control and rethink <clears throat> the way opioids are prescribed. Um, Kaiser in Southern California um, has. Um, 
really um, managing uh, the prescription of opioids and, it, and it's resulted, I mean, it, the doctor is still in charge, but they get pop-up screens that, you know, really give them a lot of good information in real time about, um, you know, and questions to ask before prescribing an opioid. Um, there are emergency rooms in uh, LA County and I think either Orange or San Diego that have come together and um, formed, you know, come up with new guidelines and policies for emergency room physicians in terms of prescribing opioids um, in an emergency situation. And um, it just allow it reinforces doctors to um, follow what um, now um, has come to be seen as best practices um, with the new um, CDC guidelines and to kind of give them something um, you know, to be able to say no or to say, you don't need that many. I'm only giving you three or five or whatever. Um, you know, come back tomorrow if it's still really bad, that kind of thing. Um, so I, I think things are starting to change. We're going to end with two data questions aimed at the reporters on the panel. One is from Meg Wingerter, and she asks, where would you start looking into increasing mortality rates in a state where coroner's reports aren't public records, and Jackie Fortier's is really very s similar. I live in a closed record state. You have to be related to the deceased to get any reports or data. How can you report on the problem without having any searchable data? So, um, um, oh, I was just gonna say yep, states, go um, I mean, states do keep track of, um, um, overdose deaths, they might fall under a big category that's called poisoning, um, but I would start with your, your um, state vital statistics of, of public health office. That will give you, you know, statewide data, possibly broken down by county. Um, and go ahead, Kim. Oh, uh, you know, I have problems even in California, which is, uh, you know, has better open record laws than many states in terms of getting the state wide um, death statistics. Um, so we ended up using uh, federal data that keeps track of things, you know, by county. And so um, you're gonna have a problem if you're trying to get down to like the city level, but um, the um, wonder data, which is the CDC's um, da data set that tracks, you know, cause of death, that's um, a good place to start, um, and uh, and the um, Lisa had this on her on her PowerPoint, but there's also that survey that is um, a national survey that is is really helpful. But the 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 thing that um, I mean, I had a really hard time when I was in California, and yes, I was able to get the coroner reports with some uh um help but one one way that you could do it is you could use the cdc data so that you could see what the trend is in your area um and compare it to what it looks like nationwide and then when it comes down to trying to get the stories of specific women you know maybe you find a dozen women um and or um survivors you know family survivors that will um, tell you about their story and then you know you get that specific death certificate it's um, but but like I said uh, I wouldn't lose heart because there is some really good there are some really good national databases that break things down at the county level and one thing I really really would encourage people to do because like I said, our data person was kind of stuck and wasn't finding the poly drug use data that I that I was looking for. And I just started reading academic papers that had looked at this issue and they said what their data sets were and how they did it. And um, they, they said what surveys they used and they said what formulas they used. And that can often serve as a roadmap so you can figure out how you can do it. And anything that shows like a United States map that's part of the research paper that shows what it looks like from region to region, use some kind of data that broke it down regionally. Well, I'd like to thank our three panelists for this um, really insightful uh, set of presentations. I also wanted to thank our participants who stuck with us um, 
And for uh, I just so you know, there were uh, really dozens of questions we couldn't answer because we've run out of time. Um, but I hope that the resources on our website, which we'll be sharing, will help to address some of those. Also, we'll be sending you a quick survey asking you for your feedback on this webinar and for ideas for future ones. Um, thank you again. We'll be sh sharing the archived version of this a little later today.